um, behind us is a Bonneville honey, Dam. Honey, let, uh, let's do this. Hello, guys. Welcome to my channel. Uh, I am Luz Cook, and this is my husband, Richard Cook. Can <laughs> <laughs> it just be rich? <laughs> okay, my husband, Richard Cook. <laughs> guys welcome to my channel um, <laughs> go on, go on. let's have fun okay here. everybody this is Bonneville down welcome to Lucy's channel behind us is Bonneville Dam <laughs> <laughs> and what else okay everybody here we are at Bonneville Dam Oregon cut <laughs> Up. As far as we can go. He knows it's cold. Okay. It's nice there though. Where do ships go through? Too bad it ain't opening yet. Mm-hmm. I bet you there's a lot of water coming out to open it. Oh, nice. And that's the lock, another lock. Wow, this is the dam. What's the name of the dam? Bonneville Dam. Bonneville Dam. Oops, there's a car. Imagine how many years they build this dam. Yeah. Looks like there used to be a train that ran through here. The tracks. Look at the last picture. How do I look at the last picture? Yeah. Here? Yeah. Got a close up. Mm -hmm. I can get even more. One, two. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Bonneville Down. The U.S. Army, uh, we are in charge of any, or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is in charge of any waterway that is navigable by a barge. So the Columbia River here, we have a lot of uh, river traffic. So we are in charge of making sure that the river is navigable, unlike what this picture shows here. This is what this river looked like before they built the Bonneville Dam. Um, they wanted to make the river navigable because the uh, up above us, the rapids stopped a lot of the uh, boats being able to come through this area. And during the westward expansion, they used the river to travel. Uh, as part of FDR's New Deal, bringing electricity in the rural parts of the country is why we have a powerhouse as well. Um, and all of this happened during the Great Depression. So uh, it was excellent. They put 3,000 people to work. So the original construction took four years, and it was completed in 1938. Wow. So we are going to be going into the original powerhouse, which is this uh, here. It's also that concrete building. You guys drove across it on your way to the visitor center today. Um, so 
the powerhouse we'll talk about inside the powerhouse, because that makes sense, right? Uh, but also, you guys drove by the spillway, which is the large dam out there. The spillway it does not create any electricity. It is basically a bypass for water. In the springtime, we have a lot of snow melt coming down river. We are what's called a run of the river dam. We are not very tall, so we cannot store a lot of that water. So whatever comes to us has to go through one way or the other. Uh, between April and September, you can see water coming through the spillway because during that time we're actually court ordered to send a certain amount of water through and that helps the juvenile fish bypass the dam as well. The uh, navigation lock you guys drove across as well on your way here. That original navigation lock, it was the biggest and the best. It could hold two barges and one tugboat, a single lift because there are 60 feet in elevation difference above and below the dam. And then finally, the fish ladders. The ladders were actually the first part of the original construction completed. The fish are very important to the people here. They knew they could not interrupt the migration process. So salmon have always been able to migrate around the dam here. Four years, this is care of their original construction. But now it's the 70s and people have figured out the Pacific Northwest is a pretty cool place to live. Uh, unfortunately, they're bringing with them all their gadgets and gizmos that use electricity and we are in an energy crisis. We're asked to build another powerhouse. Uh, we cannot build it over here on the Oregon side because there's a giant cliff out there. Uh, but on the Washington side, there's a very nice flat piece of land. The problem, there was a town there. So they moved the entire town of North Bonneville, about 700 homes that sat right here downriver to where it is today. If you remember from that old black and white picture, the spillway used to be connected to the Washington shoreline. So they built the second powerhouse, they then dredged the shoreline making the river wider here. There are 10 generators in that powerhouse. So, oh, and there's 10 generators in this powerhouse. I forgot to mention that part. Uh, between both powerhouses is a capacity of 1,227 megawatts or about 900,000 homes. So remember I said that original navigation lock, it was the biggest and the best? Well, now there are seven locks and dams above us leading to Lewiston, Idaho, and they were all built bigger and better. So we became the bottleneck of the Columbia River. So in 1993, our new navigation lock was complete. It can hold five barges and one tugboat, still a single lift of that 60 foot elevation difference, but it's much faster, uh, much safer than the original navigation lock. This is what the inside of it would look like if you were going inside. So you can now get 465 miles inland by boat. Why do we need to get 465 miles inland by boat? Trade, agriculture. Agriculture, trade. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, what do I want to say? Not produce, but a lot of uh, cargo going up and down the river. We have um, the nation's number one wheat export coming downriver. We have a lot of auto, wood products, barley, a lot of stuff. We also have riverboat cruises that use the lockage system going up and down river as well. All right, so the fish ladders, we're going to go outside and see the fish ladders. That's how the adult fish go up river to spawn. And the juvenile fish are going down river to the ocean to grow nice and big. So we talked about how they can get through the spillway. That dates back to the original construction as the best route for those fish to get through. It's a 97% survival route. Uh, but we also have a couple of bypasses. So on this map here, we are currently right here on Bradford Island, which Bradford Island, out of all of these islands, is the only natural island. All of the other islands here are man-made. So, on the Washington side, you see this little green chute right here? Yeah. This is originally our ice and trash chute. The way the river flows, the fish were going through the ice and debris chute and going into that very slow moving <coughs> water. Now the fish are only about the size of your finger at this point. They cannot swim very well. What hangs out in very slow moving water? I know you guys know this. Catfish. Predators, exactly. So they were gobbling up all the baby fish. So they extended that chute to the end of this island, this orange line here, so that the water from, cat, from the spillway and the powerhouse come together to continue them on down the river down to the ocean. That is now a 99 to 100% survival rate for those juvenile fish. 
Uh, also, along the front of the second powerhouse, right here in the upper part of the water column, we have screens. The screens, they rotate just like a people mover or a treadmill, and they're pulling the fish towards the entrance to two underground tubes. Those tubes go underground and around the dam two miles to our juvenile fish monitoring facility. When you guys were driving in, you may have looked across the river and saw two concrete columns sticking out with water spraying. That is the exit for this bypass system. Now we're not spraying the fish, right? The fish come out underneath, but what's in the air that likes to eat fish? Birds. birds, exactly. So we're spraying the water to deter the birds at that point so they don't eat all the oh. fish. Okay, that is a 95 to 100% survival rate for those juvenile fish. What is another way the fish can get around the dam? What do you think? Fish ladder. Well, that's for the adult fish are going to get around the dam using the fish ladder. You're right. But what about the baby fish? How else is water moving through the dam? What do you think? Um, swimming around the water? Unfortunately, they can't swim around the dam. Hmm. But swimming through the dam? Swimming through the dam, but how? Like with those little great things. Oh, the spillway. Yep, they can go through the spillway. Yeah. <laughs> What is next on my list? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> turbines. Through the turbines, exactly. Water goes through the turbines, so fish go where the water goes. But when I say that we are sending our fish through our turbines, everybody thinks we're making fish smoothies here at Bonneville. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you, we are not. So we are gonna go outside and take a look at the turbine, and I'm gonna explain to you how the fish can pass through those safely. Uh, any questions before we head outside? Okay, what's your question? How fast can fish swim? Ooh, it depends on the type of fish. Salmon? Salmon can swim 16 miles an hour. Wow. Probably faster, actually, depending on how old they are. Okay, so we are going to head right out the front door and go to that giant turbine that's out there. They replaced all the turbines between 1994 and 2010 with a newer design. So now we're going to talk about that fish-friendly turbine, right? So the blades on these turbines, they turn depending on the water pressure that's coming in. You can see that there is a gap between the blade and the hub, the main part here. Fish can get stuck in that gap. So the new design, which is pictured right here, the blade actually recedes into the hub so there's no more gap. The hub is also narrower on the new design, so the water is less turbid going through. Fish have an air sac, and when they go through a quick pressure change, uh, the same thing as in humans, we, the nitrogen in their blood uh, is actually what, what kills the fish. It's not that they're getting chopped up, because if you see the outside of the blades here, they're not very thick, right? The fish, remember, they're only about the size of your finger. Um, so that water pressure changes what kills the fish, not getting them chopped up. Um, so the change in the hub design helps lessen that water pressure change for the fish. There's also a new shiny ring that goes along the outside of the blade so that the fish can't get stuck between the blades and the housing. Newer design, about the same efficiency for us, but it goes from an 85% survival rate for the juvenile fish to a 95% survival rate. Now, this design is in Powerhouse 1. This design is still in Powerhouse 2 on the Washington side. That's why we have those added bypasses I was talking about on that Powerhouse, because they're trying to get the 60 years use out of the turbines over there, because turbines are very expensive. <laughs> so that's why they added those, those bypasses instead. Any questions? Yes. Are these variable pitch, or is this just like a one speed? So these turbines in this powerhouse will always be spinning at 75 rotations per minute, but the speed does depend on the water pressure. So depending on that water pressure, the blades will adjust to make sure that it's always spinning at that 75 RPM. Any other questions? All right, we are going to head towards the powerhouse.
fish that are returning to go upriver. So right below, right here, two of those come together for the final journey. They need to gain that 60 feet in elevation difference, and they do so over about a quarter of a mile. In between each one of these walls, the elevation gains about one foot. They do not have to jump up and over each wall. There's a hole about two foot wide in each wall they can swim through instead. By this point in their life, most of these fish are no longer eating. We do not want them to use up all of their energy just to get around us because they could still have to swim up to a thousand miles to get home to spawn. These fish are going to the exact same place they were born. How do they know how to get there? Anybody know? Sense of smell. When these fish are fingerling, remember, they're imprinted with the scent of the water that they were in. So they're out in the ocean, up by Alaska, down by California, anywhere between one and five years. It's time to spawn. They are recalling that scent, finding the Columbia River, and following it up to the exact same place they were born. Isn't that amazing? It's crazy. <laughs> now, as they swim through Bonneville, every single fish is counted. And we have people who are counting these fish. There is no computer algorithm that can do everything that a human can do. They are saying the species of the fish, the age of the fish, whether it's a full-grown adult or a jack, which is kind of like a teenager fish, and they are saying whether it's a hatchery or a wild. It's nice. Right there, touching a stator coil. If you guys want to look right on over, that, 
There are hundreds of those inside each of the generators lining the outside of this round red, white, and blue part that we can see. Miles and miles of copper. So as the magnet spins by the copper, that's what's exciting the electrons, that's what's making the electricity. It then goes out to the back of the powerhouse to our step-up transformers. We are stepping up this electricity from 13,800 volts to 230,000 volts before it hits the power lines. Because as it travels, it creates friction, and that heat dissipates some of that electricity. The electricity, as soon as it hits the power lines, is no longer ours. BPA takes over, Bonneville Power Administration, they're part of the U.S. Department of Energy. They're in charge of selling all the federal hydroelectricity throughout the Pacific Northwest. They can send it as far east as Montana and as far south as Southern California. Most of the electricity made here at Bonneville does stay in Oregon and Washington, though. Excuse me. BPA tells us the amount of electricity produced, and I mean like every 10 minutes, they are adjusting the generators to meet the demand because there is no way to store hydroelectricity. Once it is produced, it has to be used. The only way to store it is to store the water, and we are not a storage dam, right? So any water that's coming to us has to go through. So they are adjusting the generators constantly to meet that demand. BPA sells the electricity at cost to public utilities. We're federal, they're federal, we can't make a profit, so the consumer gets that cost savings. All right, my last fun fact of the day. If you look up towards the ceiling here, you can see this orange piece of machinery. That is a bridge crane. That crane runs the entire length of the powerhouse on the railroad tracks, you can see. As you can see, it can lift 300 tons. Now, I could not imagine what weighed 300 tons, so I had to Google. Y'all know what the Statue of Liberty looks like, right? She weighs 225 tons. This crane can lift the Statue of Liberty, but it cannot lift the heaviest piece of our machinery, which is the rotor. The rotor weighs 410 tons with those electromagnets on it. So down the other end of the road, there is a second bridge crane. When the two bridge cranes work together, it's called a super crane. See, isn't that fun? If they're going to be working on any parts of the generators, they're going to be doing it right down here. This is called the pit. There will never be another generator here. They need this area to work on them. Every year they do preventative maintenance on the generators, and every four years they will take one apart, replace any worn items, uh, and look for any damages. Now you guys are free to continue looking around. If you have any other questions, please let me know. And as I said, you guys are free to leave whenever you would like. Uh, I'm just gonna put the microphone away though, so you all don't have to keep hearing me talk. And I wanna thank you all so much for joining me today, and I hope you- Wow, this is big. Honey, this is real? You wanna go see a big sturgeon? Yeah.